All right. Some of you went to sleep during the worship. That's okay. But we're going to wake up. Everybody raise your hand. Both hands. All right. Now I want you to bring them down like this. And then I want you to push the person next to you out of their chair. All right. No, don't do that. But we are glad that you're here. And we're glad that you joined us online today as well. I, I just a, a little vision before I get into the message. I always like to cast vision when I can about what God is doing in our church and what God is doing for you. I was thinking about this, and this is not something I had planned. It's just something a while ago that God just kind of impressed on my heart. Do you know how easy it is to get out of the habit of going to church? And I realize we've got technology now where people can join us online, but even with that, it's very, very easy. Most people don't realize how easy it is. It only takes just a couple of weeks <clears throat> and you're in a habit of not going and you really don't think about it. And I'm not trying to get on anybody. I'm so glad that you're here. But here's what I was thinking about. Um, statistics show that over 50% of American Christians that were faithful to church every week do not go to church at all. I'm not talking about like they decrease the amount that they go I'm talking about they don't go at all. And uh, I applaud you for being here today. But here's what just this little phrase God laid on my heart back, uh, backstage as I was thinking and praying about this. Each one reach one. Now, we can talk about numbers all we want, but everybody understands one. I, even I understand that. Each one reach one. Here's what I want to challenge you to do, both online and here in the room. Think about somebody that used to come or maybe somebody that's never been and I want you to do everything in your power to reach one other person. That's pretty simple, isn't it? If everybody will do that, we will begin to really see God do a great, great work in our community and uh, I, I'm convinced that we can do that. Each one reach one. Here's the second little bit of vision casting I wanna do today. We have lived in the past two years with an extraordinary amount of fear. As a culture, we have just been inundated with things that make us afraid, particularly with COVID-19. We all know about that and how uh, devastating that has been to some people and how uh, fearful that can make us. Um, and then when you throw in the war that is going on in Ukraine right now, and everybody talking about the threat potentially of nuclear war or America going to war. There is this overwhelming urge to be fearful. I mean, I'll admit, we look at that and we're like, man, you know, that could be a terrible thing if that happens. And what begins to happen is rather than living in the present and rather than living in faith, and, and rather in living, trusting God, we begin to trust our feelings. And God gave us feelings. I'm not saying that feelings aren't important, but you gotta be careful with feelings. How many of you know that if you trust your feelings, sometimes they can deceive you? And when you throw in what's going on in the economy with gas prices and inflation, and then you throw politics on top of it, it's a wonder that some of us get up out of bed in the morning. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. I want you to trust God. Now, I realize that when you talk about inflation and gas prices, that that reduces the amount of disposable income, technically, that you have. I get that, okay? Um, and, and here's what I want to challenge you to do. I realize that for many people in the room, online, in our community, uh, that because of all this, it's caused some struggles. And here's what I want to challenge you to do. <clears throat> and I'm not trying to put pressure on anybody because we believe what we call in grace giving here at Avalon Church. You say, what does that mean? It means that the more of the grace of God you see, the bigger picture you see of Jesus, the more you're going to trust him and the, the more you're going to be able to trust him to give. Because I, here's what I know about most people, and especially Christians, we love to give. It makes us feel good to give. It makes us feel like that we're contributing, that we're being a part of something bigger than ourselves. And obviously, we're obeying Scripture, and that makes us feel good as well. And so here's what I want to challenge you to do. I'm going to just tell you a little story. 
I want to challenge you to test and to challenge your fear with your faith. When uh, Kim and I started this church, uh, I'd gone on a 40-day fast, knew that this was what God had called me to do. I had no doubt about it. Now, I'd, that I was coming from a time that I made more money than I'd ever made in my life. In fact, I made about five times as much in evangelism per year than I did before when I was serving uh, as a pastor. And so I, we had come from a, a, a good time, uh, at least financially. And, um, but also, when we started this church, there were two things that were glaring. One, I had no guaranteed income. None. Now, thankfully that this church has always taken care of me, but I had no guarantee. We didn't know if we were going to get paid or not. Um, And the second thing was I had some debt from my evangelistic ministry from traveling and uh, and everything. We started some conferences, but we had about $100,000 of debt. And it was good debt, but I wasn't expecting to have to shut it down. And so here we were. We went from making a great living financially uh, to having no guaranteed income, zero. And not only did we have our regular debt, house payment, things of that nature, I had $100,000 that basically was being charged very high interest at the time. And so I had no idea what we were going to do. And so you know what Kim and I did? And we prayed about this because we believe that God is a God who honors his promises. And we believe that God is a God who blesses generosity. And we believe that God promises to bless you in many ways. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that if you give God a hundred bucks, you're going to get a thousand by the end of the day. Or if you give God a thousand bucks that you're going to get a brand new car by the end of the week. We don't believe that. But I challenge you. I challenge you to read scripture and find any area of life that God does not promise to bless you in when you are generous and when you give. He promises to bless you health-wise and in your finances and in your marriage. My point is, it's not prosperity theology by any stretch of imagination. I'm not that guy. But I do believe that God blesses obedience and that God blesses mostly faith. So here's what Kim and I did. We knew that we were facing financial challenges. And I had an additional 100 grand uh, in, on top of my regular debt, no guaranteed salary. So you know what Kim and I did? We decided that we were not gonna give less, we were gonna give more. You say, well, that's dumb. Well, only if you don't believe the Bible. Now, from a human sense, I understand, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. But what we decided that we were going to do is we were going to give our way out of debt. And uh, so we did. And that first year, uh, we ended up giving uh, over and above the tithe. In fact, we even dipped into our retirement and gave. And did you know that within 12 months, not only did I have a regular salary here at this church, 100% of that $100,000 was paid off. 100%. Now, you you, you might be thinking, well, how much did the church pay you? (laughs) That did not come from the church. That came from outside. And my point is this. During times of fear, you know what we need to do? We need to trust God. And I realize that there are a lot of things that are fearful right now, but I want to challenge you. Each one reach one and trust God. Each one reach one and trust God. Now, that's my little sermon before the sermon. Uh, I do want to tell you how to give here at Avalon Church, and they'll put it on the screens for us. You can give online. You can give through the church app. Uh, You can give by texting the number 84321. Uh, You obviously can give in person. Now, we don't pass the buckets here, but there are ways for you to give on the way out if you'd like to drop it in one of the drop boxes on the way out. And I want to say thank you for your giving. But, you know, the fact is, saying thank you for something that God blesses you for, I I like doing it. But you know what you and I should do? We should not wait for the pastor to say thank you for giving. What we should do, we should thank God for allowing us to be a part of what he blesses. And I believe that when you do that, God does bless you. And once again, 
If you're not in a position to give, you're not, you, your faith maybe isn't where uh, it needs to be to do what Kim and I talked about. We're glad that you're here and we're not putting pressure on you, but we do want you to know the blessings that God will pour out in your life if you trust him, if you trust him. So anyway, we're gonna get into the message now. Uh, And the title of the message that I chose, um, I probably should have a different title, but the title of the message is Managing Marital Conflict. Now, technically the, the message is Managing Conflict. That's what it is, because I want you to know that this is not just about people that are married, okay? In fact, this is for people who are married, divorced, widowed, single. If you're single and wanna get married, it's for you. If you're single and never wanna be married, it's for you as well, because what we're gonna learn today from the principles that Jesus gave us is how that you and I can really begin to manage the conflict in our lives. Now, Kim and I have been married for 35 years and we're gonna celebrate 36 years of marriage in May. And uh, thank you, thank you. I wasn't doing that for applause, but thank you. And in my years of ministry, I've dealt with just about every situation that you can imagine. I really have. And I've had to learn to deal with things personally, professionally, and biblically. And here's what I know, that what we're talking about today is not helpful because Richie says it, it's helpful because Jesus says it, okay? And all I'm gonna do is tell you what Jesus said and try to give you some interpretation. Now, what I'm gonna do today is a little different than what I normally do. Normally, I'll read a passage, then I'll go back and we'll give you some principles from that passage. Today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read two verses, give you three principles. I'm gonna read two more verses, give you one principle, I'm gonna read two more verses and give you three principles, all right? So seven, everybody, if you know uh, anything about the Bible, seven is the number of perfection. So that's the perfect number of points to give you today, but I promise you it will not be a very long, long drawn out message, okay? So here we're gonna begin in Matthew chapter five and what he said was shocking. And you're, when you first read it, you're probably gonna say, what does that have at all to do with managing conflict, and I'm gonna show you, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter five, verse 27, he says, and you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Now, I'm sure that the crowd there would be like the crowd, everybody would agree with that, yeah, that's a good thing, uh, not to commit adultery, but notice what Jesus did. He took something that everybody thought, that everybody agreed with, that it was so common, and so common sense that you didn't really give it any thought and he ratcheted it up. Here's what he said. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, ladies, Jesus wasn't leaving you out. This was culturally the way they addressed things at that time. But his point is this. Every person has had lustful intent. Every person has had lust in their heart. Now, whether it's physically uh, looking at a person and lusting after that person sexually, or whether it's fantasizing about, boy, I tell you what, if I was able to be married to that guy, it would be a whole lot better than the bum I'm married to. I thought I was married to Prince Charming, and it turns out, I have a couch that burps. That's all I've got. Sure would be nice if I could marry that guy portrayed in that movie or in that novel, right? I mean, the point is this. Jesus was ratcheting up something that was accepted by everyone. Now, I wanna show you three principles about managing conflict. Now, you say, where do you get this from? Well, I wanna show you. The first principle is this, because he shows conflict in the way that we think about things, in the way we deal with things, even in the way we think. Here's what he says. Conflict is inevitable. Conflict is inevitable. Whether you are married and you love each other and you're on the honeymoon still, whether you are not married, whether you've been married for a long time and you're like, wow, uh, this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It doesn't matter where you find yourself, Conflict is inevitable, not just in marriage, but in life. 
We are all going to face conflict. Now, I want to just show you something beyond what you might see when you read this. Jesus was making a point. And his point, and we're going to see this in the next couple of, uh, of principles here, but his point was very simple. You cannot keep the law. We're talking about the Ten Commandments. In other words, being morally good. He said that is not the way to be made right with God. That was his point. His point was not that you should break the Ten Commandments. Nobody's ever going to say that. Oh, yeah, Ten Commandments say don't uh, murder. Go ahead and murder because we are under grace, not under law. Well, nobody's ever going to say that, okay? But his point was that we all need God's grace. Listen to Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified. So we all sin, but we're justified by his grace. How's that? As a gift, as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And the point is this, you gotta learn how to manage conflict because conflict is inevitable. Now you can deescalate conflict, but there is going to be conflict in your marriage, in your relationships at work, in your relationships with your kids, in your relationships with your friends. Kim and I, uh, I guess the first year we were married, um, actually it was the second year, we bought a house after we'd been married about a year. And after we just had moved into this house, we had not even been married for two years yet. Um, we had a, a garage, uh, but we didn't have garage door openers with it. There was one garage door opener, but not enough for both cars. Well, anyway, I got home a little early. I knew Kim what time she was coming home. And so I went into the garage, I parked the car in the garage and shut the garage door because I knew that she would not get out physically and open, open it, but she would come right in the house. And so what I did was that I was going to surprise her. And in fact, I wasn't gonna surprise her, I was gonna scare her, all right? That's what was my plan. And so uh, she, uh, sure enough, got home and I had hid in the closet, not my closet, but her closet, and I knew her routine. She would come home and she would hang up a coat or a sweater or whatever she had. And uh, so she got into the house and she was making her rounds. She went into the kitchen. She went into the living room. And before you know it, I'm waiting there. And uh, she opens her closet door and it was dark in there. She could not see me. And I jumped out and go, rah, like this and grabbed her. Uh, my first point was there's going to be conflict, all right? I underestimated, <laughs> I underestimated the conflict that would cause. The good news is it gave Kim a good chance to use that forgiving spirit that the Bible talks about. <laughs> but the fact is, to this day, we've been married. The reason I told you how long we've been married is because 36 years in May, she still talks about that moment. Now, it evidently scared her a lot worse than I intended to scare her, and it caused conflict. And what's my point? Conflict is inevitable. Now, here's the second principle I want you to see. You need to give and receive grace. So he talks about grace. He talks about the fact that you need grace. But if you need grace, guess what you gotta do? Gotta give it. If you're gonna need it, and trust me, we're all gonna need it. We needed it in the past, we're gonna need it again in the future. And if you need grace, you better learn to give it. It is so incredibly important. Now what Jesus was doing was raising the stakes on how we view being made right with God by our own goodness. He was not suggesting, don't, don't, don't see what Jesus was not saying. He was not suggesting that looking at someone and thinking a bad thought is the same level as breaking the marriage vows and having an affair. That's not what he was saying. But what he was showing us was root causes of sin. And the fact is, we often try to justify ourselves by how good we think we have been. 
And, and we'll start saying things about the commandments. Oh, well, you know, I've been good. Surely I'm better than that person. And surely I'm good enough that if I died, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I've noticed that we're pretty good at giving ourselves a break. And we're not quite as good at giving others a break over the same things. Now, what Jesus was showing us is that a rules-based relationship with God and in marriage never works, ever. It just doesn't work. Let let, let me show you um, how, uh, what I'm talking about, what Jesus was doing was taking the 10 commandments and showing that we cannot be made right with God by keeping the 10 commandments. Let me just give them to you real quick. Uh, The first commandment is you're to love God more than anyone or anything. And anyone that's ever honest can never say that you've always loved God more than anything in your life because you haven't. None of us have. So guilty on the first one. Number two, don't put yourself, your job, the second commandment is to have no images before God. So don't put yourself, your job, your spouse, your kids, your boyfriend, or anything else before God ever. I don't want to take a poll, but I know for a fact that 100% of the people in this room and 100% of the people watching online are guilty of breaking that commandment. I am, so are you. So we're guilty on two, two out of two. Third commandment is don't misuse God's name. He says don't take his name in vain. Now, there may be some of you that were raised in a Christian home and you're like, well, I have never broken that commandment. Well, let me tell you what that commandment actually means. It means don't misrepresent the name of God. You know what that means? It means don't be a hypocrite. Yeah, we, uh, we apply it to our language, but have you ever misrepresented who you are? You ever pretended to be something that you're not? You ever pretended to be a better Christian than you are? Hello, we're shaving close right here with this. The fact is, all of us have taken him for granted. We've pretended to be better than we are. We've been hypocritical at some point in our life. So three out of three. Uh, The fourth commandment, take the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, I realize we don't live by the Old Testament law anymore, but the principle is still there for us. You need to take a Sabbath day to rest. We talked about this in the pre-service meeting with the worship team today. You need to take a Sabbath rest. And what does that mean? It means that every seven days, at least, you need to take a day off. Now, once again, most of us don't have a problem with that in, in our minds. Um, and I realize some people uh, probably have a more difficult work schedule than others, but he's not just talking about going to work. The Sabbath day was intended for us to focus on God and to reflect how he is the one who provides everything. So let me ask you a question. Have you for every seven days of your life stopped and quit working for a little while and thank God that he is the one that has provided every, I realize all of us can be thankful, but if we're honest, I'll be honest. I mean, in starting this church, there was a long time that I was breaking this commandment. I was working seven days a week. I, I'm doing God's work. Well, God didn't say don't take a, a Sabbath rest unless you're doing God's work and then it's okay. Well, the point is we're all guilty of that. So those first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The second six commandments deal with our relationship with our fellow man. Starts with don't dishonor your parents. Never dishonor, disrespect, or disobey your parents. Anybody here think you've been 100% on that all your life? Of course not. The sixth commandment is don't murder. Oh, I'm not guilty there. I was actually talking with a guy one time. We were on a a flight and uh, we began talking about this and I began to talk about that I was a pastor. He goes, oh, that's cool. He says, you must be a really good person. And I saw an opportunity to talk to him about having a relationship with Christ. And I said, you know what? I've broken all the commandments just like everybody else. He goes, really? I said, yeah, I have. He said, even murder? I said, even that one. He got very uncomfortable and started scooting away from me. I said, let me explain. What Jesus talked about was root causes and that hate is the root cause of that. So if you've ever hated anybody, you're guilty of murder. 
He, he said, don't commit adultery. Don't lust, don't fantasize about someone who's not your spouse. Uh, don't look at sexually charged Im images. Don't fantasize about some novel or movie. We're all guilty. Everybody has broken that commandment. Uh, the eighth commandment, don't steal. Have you ever cheated on a test? Have you ever taken anything that wasn't yours? Or, according to Malachi, have you ever failed to give God the first 10% of your income? If so, you're guilty. Number nine, don't lie ever. Anybody ever told a white lie? Anybody ever told a bold-faced lie? Anybody ever tried to lie to get out of trouble and you ended up having to lie again because of that lie and then before you knew it, you lost count of all the lies? The point is, we're not to lie. And then the last one, don't covet. Don't covet. Why would that be in the 10 Commandments? I mean, that seems like the least offensive of all, coveting. But the point is this, we're always to be content in God. Anybody here want to honestly say you've always been content with everything in your life? And we're not talking about the drive to do better or to get out of debt or to buy a house or to pay off your car. We're not talking about that. We're talking about covetousness. You ever coveted what someone else had? God says we're not to do that. And his point is that you and I need God's grace, okay? Uh, so the first point is that we're all going to have conflict. The second point is that you and I need to give and receive grace. If we're talking about dealing with a conflict in our lives, we've got to learn how to do that. And then the third point is this. You must deal with root causes. Now, let me just encourage you in this way. If you're married, the arguments that you have are most likely not about what you're actually arguing about. Have you ever noticed that? You ever get in an argument and after a while, you're just mad and you can't remember what it was that you were arguing about? And, and the point is this, what we've got to learn to do is to deal with root causes. Because until you deal with the root cause, aka uh, lust being the root sin of committing adultery, until we learn to do that, we're not going to be able to manage the conflict in our lives. Uh, when Kim and I were first in ministry, she said to me one day, I think you love the church more than you love me. We were both, I was working so much, so many hours. And rather than looking at my own failure to show her love and commitment and to make her feel loved and special and comfortable, did I hear what she was saying? and reassure her, give her a little more attention, promise her that I was not gonna do better. Nope, that's not what I did. I got angry and, and inevitably, you know, when you say really dumb things, you can remember it for a really long time. I looked at my lovely wife who served Jesus and anybody who knows Kim knows that this woman is committed to Jesus as much as anybody that you've ever met. And I looked at my precious sweet wife and I said, you don't love Jesus very much. Now, I did not deal with the root cause. See, the root cause was I was neglecting her. I didn't want to admit it. Once again, I justified it because I was working for Jesus. And, and whatever it is that you use as an excuse does not really give you an excuse, does it? We've got to learn to deal with the root cause. And, and once again, back to this text, Rarely is an affair ever about lust. I want you to understand that. In fact, if you read the book of Proverbs, you'll find that affairs most of the time begin not with the eyes, but with the ears. You start hearing what somebody else has to say. Oh, that sounds good. Oh, my wife doesn't talk to me that way. Oh, my husband doesn't talk to me like that. It begins with the ears. But normally the root cause of an affair is not lust. You know what it is? It is neglect, busyness, lack of communication, spiritual neglect, discontentment, or selfishness. There rarely are affairs started because of lust. 
And, and my point is this. If you and I don't learn how to deal with root causes, then we're never going to be able to resolve the conflict in our lives. Now, let me read uh, verses 29 and 30 for you. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Once again, Jesus is using hyperbole here, okay? That was a very effective communication tool in the first century, uh, especially there in, uh, in Palestine. So what Jesus was doing is kind of like telling a funny story or making a funny comment that had a point. He said, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand uh, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. What was his point? Was, it, was his point that if you ever look at something you shouldn't look at, that you just grab that eye and just like rip it out? No, that was not his point. His point was very simple. And this is the fourth principle. You got to make an extreme commitment. Make an extreme commitment. Marriage must have an extreme commitment because it pictures the commitment that Christ made to us. And we must make an extreme commitment, not just to marriage, but to the Christian life. Trust me, it is not enough to be casually committed to Christ. It is not enough to be casually committed to your spouse. No one in the right mind would say at the wedding, and I've done a lot of weddings in my life, and I've never heard in the wedding vows anyone say that I'm gonna have and hold you until desire or conflict or a better offer do us part. You know why? Every person that goes into marriage, you know what they think? This is forever. And most people, after they've been married for a while, they're going, oh God, this is forever, right? So, but no, my point is this, joking aside, you've got to learn to make an extreme commitment. Now, let me just give you an example of some extreme commitments that I've made in my life, okay? Now, you might think these are extreme, and they probably are. Uh, but I'm just using this as an example to show you how that we must make an extreme commitment to Christ. We have a policy at our church that you don't ride in a car or go to lunch alone with the opposite sex if you're married. You say, well, that is dumb. It might be, according to some people, but you know what? It also helps us avoid unnecessary conflict in our church and in our staff. Uh, it was so, we so much have made a commitment. Um, years ago, uh, my assistant, a wonderful, wonderful woman, an incredible worker. She broke down, her car broke down, I'm not exaggerating, about three quarters of a mile from our church office. And I drove by her and saw that she had broke down. So I stopped and I said, what happened? She said, well, my car stopped. She said, will you just go ahead and give me a ride to the church office? And I said, no. He said, well, that was mean. No, I wasn't being mean. You know what I told her? I, I didn't just say no. I said, no, and I called her name. I said, look, just wait. In three minutes, I'm gonna have somebody come by and pick you up. And so that's what we did. In fact, what happened is I got somebody else to jump in the car with me, and we drove down and picked her up and brought her to the church. Only three quarters of a mile. You say, well, that was dumb. But you know what that is? That's an extreme commitment to make sure that we don't have moral failure. Kim and I made an extreme commitment in our marriage. When we got married, here's what we made a commitment to do, that we would never, ever discuss or in the context of our own marriage, use the word or even say the word divorce. And so when we got married, I told her, I said, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. And I know that for Kim, She's never talked about divorce. She might have thought about murder, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we have never used that word in our marriage. You say, why, why is that? Has there ever been conflict in your marriage? You bet. Have there been times that you're like, what in the world am I in this for? Yeah, you bet, we're, we're normal, we're human, okay? But I can tell you this, we made an extreme commitment 
uh, one of our elders um, has been such a blessing to me. All of our elders are a blessing to me, but such a blessing in this area. And I, I won't call this name, but um, he and his wife have been married for a very long time. And uh, there's just some situations going on. And this man is so committed to his wife that he is above his relationship with Christ. There's no other commitment that he's made more to stay with her through the thick and the thin, the highs and the lows. And I thought, you know, that is an example of an extreme commitment. And when he committed to his wife, and he's told me on several occasions, when I took my vows for better or worse, in sickness and in health, I took them seriously. And I'm like, man, what a blessing that is. And I'm gonna tell you this, if you're gonna have a good marriage and if you're gonna manage the inevitable conflict in your life, you've gotta make an extreme commitment. If you're gonna live a life that pleases God, guess what you've gotta do? You've gotta make a commitment to Jesus Christ that most people find extreme. They expect you to go down to that church every Sunday? I mean, come on, isn't that too much? Isn't that a bit extreme? Are you telling me you're not upset when they talk about giving the tithe, that first part of your income? Are you not seeing them for what they are? Are you not seeing them for just the shysters and the, and the tricksters that they are. They just want your money. When you make a commitment to Jesus, you're gonna make an extreme commitment. You know why? He did not make a casual commitment to us. And what he deserves is our best commitment. And according to some people, it might be a little bit extreme. But that's okay, because in marriage and in the Christian life, God wants us to make an extreme commitment. I have been a living example of this for the past couple of years. Uh, Those of you that have been here know that my physical journey, uh, you know, a little over a year ago, year and a half ago, or a year and a couple months ago, I was in bed. Then I was in a wheelchair, and then I walked with a walker, and then a cane. And now you see me. I'm not not 100% back to where I was, but I'm getting close. I'm getting closer every week, okay? And and once again, thank you for your prayers. But my point is this. Uh, A year ago, this past November, and I'm just being open and honest with you about where I was emotionally, I thought I was gonna die. Now, I know that I put on a bold face. I felt like I needed to for all the church. And I believe that God's gonna bring me back. But in my heart, can I just tell you, and I had faith and I believed God and I trusted the prayers and so forth. But you know what? In my heart, that I really, really thought was gonna happen. I thought that I was gonna die and leave Kim all alone. And I thought that I would never celebrate another anniversary as being the pastor of this church. That's really what I thought. That's how sick I really was. I lost 65 pounds in two months. I wish I'd kept some of that off, all right? I don't know why that happened. So I got better, I started gaining the weight back. And now I'm like, oh, I gotta go on a diet again. Why don't I just stay where I was? But my point is this. During those two years or year and a half that I was so sick, I have never in my life seen a greater example of someone who made an extreme commitment to her husband that my wife Kim did. She took care of me in ways that blew my mind. She took care of me in a way that demonstrated not only the love of Christ, but the extreme commitment that she made during our wedding vows. And what is my point? You gotta make an extreme commitment. Listen to the next verses and this kind of shows you the extreme commitment that Jesus was talking about. He said in verse 31, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. That was from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament law. And so God allowed divorce there, but notice what Jesus did. He said, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Talking about ratcheting it up, once again, his point was that if we try to approach 
our relationship with God based on our deeds, based on good works, based on keeping the law, we utterly fail. We utterly and completely fail. But Jesus was showing us something that I think we need to learn in handling conflict. Let me give you the three principles and I'm just gonna give them to you and we're gonna be done. The fifth principle is this, sometimes divorce is inevitable, but you need to handle it with grace. I've seen people that were some of the best Christians I've ever known and they ended up getting divorced and they turned in dealing with each other to two people that I just did not even recognize. People that were so kind and sweet that, you know, butter wouldn't even melt in their mouth, were so vicious and vile toward each other. I, literally, it was kind of scary for me. I had a very dear friend um, that was a great, he and his wife both were great Christians. Everybody thought that they wanted to emulate them. They ended up getting divorced. And it was so bad I remember there was such conflict between them that the husband was actually with me one night and we were doing some stuff for the church and his ex-wife called the cops and reported that he was breaking into their house and tearing up their house, tearing up their doors and the police came and arrested him. And I'm like, what, what, what are you, what are you doing? And they were like, well, we got to do this and you can make a statement. The guy was with me. He wasn't doing that. And and what is my point? My point is that sometimes divorce is inevitable, but you need to learn to handle it with grace. If you have an ex, handle it with grace. I realize how hard that is. I realize that some former spouses make it nearly impossible. I understand that. But you know what Jesus is teaching us here? And I believe one of the principles here, you gotta learn to handle it with grace. He said that don't divorce except on the grounds of sexual immorality. There are grounds for divorce. But we gotta learn to handle it with grace. The sixth principle is this, there is hope. There's hope. In other words, it is possible to avoid divorce. And that's gonna take work. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's not always gonna be easy. But you know what my experience has been as a pastor all these years? I found that there are people that think that the easy way out is to get a divorce and what they discovered was that was the hard way out. I've talked to so many divorced couples and I asked them to describe their ideal mate and you know, without exception, and I mean this, without exception, you know who they described? The person they were divorcing. Without exception. And and my point is this. There is hope if you follow God's word. There is hope. And the last point is this. Whether you're married, divorced, or single, you've got to embrace grace. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what your marital status is, you've got to embrace grace. If you're going to deal with conflict in your life, You must embrace the grace of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to learn from the word of God how to deal with conflict, especially in our marriages. Lord, I pray that you'd help us all to follow this. And Lord, I I pray that you would give us your grace. I know there's some people here today that are struggling, whether it's a work relationship, a family relationship, a marriage relationship. Lord, give us the ability to have hope and to embrace your grace. In Jesus' name, I pray. Before I finish my prayer, let me just ask you very quickly, number one, what is God saying to you? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? There may be some of you today that the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about some conflict that you're having in your life. Could be in your marriage, could be at work. Could be with your kids. I want to encourage you to follow God's plan. Make an extreme commitment to do what you know God is leading you to do. And then the second question I want to ask is one that I ask every week. Do you need to be saved? Do you need to trust Jesus as your Savior? If you'd say, I really do. I'm not sure about my relationship with God. 
I'm not sure if I die today that I will go to heaven. Those of you online, listen closely. I wanna lead you in a simple prayer. And once again, it's not magic words, but it's your heart trusting in Jesus that will save you. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those in the room as well, listen closely. If you wanna pray this prayer today, say something like this to God. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins and he rose from the grave. And I'm asking you today to come into my life, forgive me of my sins and to save me today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray to receive Christ today online, please click the button at the bottom of the screen to indicate to us that you have prayed to receive Christ today. If in the room today you pray to receive Christ, listen very, very closely. It's extremely important that you take that blue next step card, put your name and information on it and check that you pray to receive Christ. You say, why is that important? Because I'm gonna help walk you through your next steps as a believer. I make that commitment to you. I'm not gonna leave you hanging. I'm gonna reach out to you and try to help you. I'm not gonna bother you. I'm not gonna call you on Sunday mornings and ask if you've gotten out of bed uh, to come to church. But I do wanna be a pastor that will help you. And so I encourage you to fill that out. Now, next Sunday, speaking of Next Steps class, we have our Next Steps class. It starts at 1030, goes during the service. And if you've not been through the next step class. Let me just take a quick survey. How many have been through the next step class or some iteration of that in the past here at Avalon Church? Raise your hand. You've been through that, okay? Then there are a lot of you that, you know what your next step is? It's to go through that class. It's very important. It's very easy. We're not asking for 82 hours of commitment. We're asking you to come during a service that you're already planning to come to and it won't even be the whole thing. You'll get to come in here and hear my message. All right, so I hope you'll come next Sunday to the Next Step class. Don't forget our prayer time on Mondays. We do, the, uh, we do a prayer time where we open the church from 6.30 to 7.30. If you can't come the whole time, that's okay. If you're on your way to work and you wanna drop in, that'd be awesome. And so don't forget about that. And make sure you fill out the Next Step card if you would, if you've not filled out one before. And then finally, uh, today, after the service, we've got a meeting about the Jacksonville missions trip, and uh, we'll just say that it'll be down here uh, on this. Uh, uh, let's let's choose this section. You're, you're the you're the good section today. All right, this section over here is the winners. Uh, let's give them all a hand. They won. What did they win? God only knows. All right, so here, congratulations. There we go. You won a thumbs up today, uh, but. Uh, joking aside, let's meet there after the service. Let's everyone stand together. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for joining us online as well. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.